introduction, just very briefly, because you're going to get a full introduction tomorrow at the Green Music Center, or a full learn. Jennifer Bosner is author of our freshman year book this day, this year, called Reality, Reality Bikes Back. She is also the founder and director of, um, of the, the nonprofit called Women in Media and News. If you want to find that online, it's acronym W-I-N-N. Jennifer Bosner, thank you so much for being here. Today. I'm thrilled that you all chose Reality Bites Back as your first year book. Um, I've been hoping that that would happen at various colleges, and you guys did it, and I'm very excited uh, to talk with you. We'll do more on reality TV tomorrow night at whatever that music stadium area is. I feel like I need to get some leather pants because I'm speaking of music stadium. Right? But, uh, but today, we're going to be focusing on a different central question, which is what does journalism, advertising, and pop culture teach girls and the general public about women and ambition? And how does that shape girls and women's social, professional, and political identities? Because I know that identity is, is your first year, this particular seminar's theme. Um, and then, of course, what does that mean for all of us? But before we get into all that, I want to introduce you to a few young girls. And if we could turn the lights off. Um, a few young girls who live in Sonoma County. This is, now it's very dark. Um, okay, so this is going to be Claire, the first girl you'll see. Let's see. She is a compassionate and academically gifted nine-year-old who gets on the honor roll each semester. And now I'd like you to meet seven-year-old Luna. She's bold, curious, and athletic. She can pick up a sport instantly and begin to play with the competency and confidence of much older kids, usually who happen to be boys. She's not intimidated at all. Um, Julia, who is 11, who's, oh, sorry. Uh, in the dark, it's hard to find the not maps here. Track that, sorry. Um, Julia, who you saw before, she's 11. She was elected to student government. She's a natural leader, often the person who gets others talking when they're in conflict. And her skills in 11-year-old diplomacy earn her a lot of respect from her peers. And these two are Zoe and Phoebe. Um, Zoe is nine years old, loves writing, playing the clarinet, and singing. She wants to be a veterinarian. And she went to vet camp this summer at SSU. And Phoebe. Um, is a budding songwriter who also excels at fishing and baking, so she's, you know, a renaissance girl, I guess. At six years old, she's already put her values into practice. She decided to become a vegetarian because she believes in animal rights. So I'm going to take speaker's prerogative and introduce you to one last girl who isn't from Sonoma County, but is a very important kid to me. She's eight years old, and this is Ella, my one of my best friend's daughters. Um, she started playing soccer at age four with boys. She's eight now. Um, she rock climbs whenever she can. She was top cookie seller for her Girl Scouts troop in Chicago um, for two years in a row. And she gets straight A's and wants to be a dentist or an Olympic gymnast. And she uh, it takes gymnastics and excels there. So these girls are excelling in academics and sports and music and community leadership. But what I want you to think about is what do Sonoma County, Sonoma County girls, and more than that, what do all girls learn from the media about what they should aspire to and about what girls will be valued for? And what does the media teach boys about how they should perceive girls and women and how they should treat them? So if you could turn the lights back on for a minute. Um, to answer that question, I want to start with a quick pop quiz for you, which is, uh, does anybody here know the life of President Barack Obama's trousers? Right? No. No, no, I'm serious. Help me out. Anyone? No? All right. How about Speaker of the House, John Boehner? Um, can any of you remember any passionate news debates on cable news about whether or not people might want to have sex with Representative John Boehner? No? I'm hearing some giggles. I'm glad, actually, that none of you could give us these kinds of details about our elected officials because they have nothing to do with how they would lead our country. Yet this is often what passes for reporting and commentary when the politician at the center of the story is female. So I'm going to read you the opening of a Washington Post article, and I've got a job for you all. Count the number of sentences I read as I read them. Um, I'm just going to advance to the next. So count the number of sentences I read as I read them, and then throw up your hands and yell, stop, as soon as you hear the first inkling that this might be a story about politics. Linda 
Cortez has a new haircut. Her big sister doesn't approve. She thinks it's too spiky, Linda explains. Who cut it for you, Donna? Asks Loretta Sanchez, referring to the hairdresser they both use. Linda nods. I told her I wanted something young and a little bit edgy. Linda is younger and, yes, a little bit edgy. Loretta is older and, yes, a little bit bossy. Together, they're making history as the first sisters ever to serve together in Congress. Okay, I'm stopping now. Uh, for those of you keeping count, that was 10 sentences before we got to the Washington Post telling us that the babe with the edgy haircut was actually a high-ranking member of the government. So, if this is the new standard for how news coverage uh, covers politicians, can we imagine a Washington Post story something like this? Barack Obama's getting fat. His wife doesn't approve. I keep telling him to lose the spare tire. We have to be organic and healthy, Michelle said, encouraging him to work out for an hour a day. I don't have that kind of time, he protests. Brock is pudgy, yes, but also very busy. So instead of going to the gym, he went on a vegan diet, forgetting his, forgetting his morning muffin and instead eating only a grapefruit on his way to work in the Oval Office. Right? This is this, of course, irrelevant and insulting description of the president that didn't tell us it was the president they were talking about until way into the piece, would never and should never be considered serious journalism. And yet media regularly measure political women by their physical measurements and by personal feminizing details that have nothing to do with their experience or their policy positions. One way to uh, sort of answer that question I asked earlier about what media teach girls is to look at media coverage of female politicians, especially given the influential medium of television news. So here is how CNBC reacted after John McCain tapped Sarah Palin to be the first Republican female vice presidential candidate in 2008. This was before anybody in America knew who she was. Lights, please. from uh, 
Fox News, but I'm also showing you clips from CNN and radio programs. I'm also showing you liberal leading outlets like the following from Huffington Post. I'm going to skip a little bit to the Huffington Post. Okay, let's see. Sorry. We started a little late, so I'm trying to skip around. We were talking about Michelle Bachman and the way that she's evolved over the past year. She started the year as an Iowa mom, brought a little sexy back mid-year when she announced her candidacy speech. But I don't know. I think when her numbers went down, she should have brought down a neckline. Might have helped. And then in, um, in, see, I don't, okay, sorry. I'm just not used to this computer. Sorry about that. Um, in 2008, on a campaign stop, at one point, Hillary Clinton, when she was running for the Democratic nomination, happened to wear this jacket um, with a v-neck uh, camisole under it on C-SPAN. And that led to three days of uh, news, sort of frothy news panic about her quote-unquote cleavage controversy. Um, I will let you take a listen. Oh, and even the Washington Post um, uh, media critic at the time welcomed the cleavage conversation. Let the cleavage conversation begin. Um, you'd think that basically, with the fervor that the media covered this, you'd think that she was Lindsay Lohan, and they were paparazzi, and she'd had a nip slip or something. Um, but yeah, it's true. She went to see to C-SPAN, and she forgot to leave her breast at home. How dare she? So can you imagine every major newspaper and TV broadcast devoting days to male senators' so-called trouser bulges or headlines about quote-unquote Joe Biden's package? I really can't believe that I haven't just say that out loud, but it is the same thing, right? And female politicians are subjected to these kinds of gender double standards in ways that their male counterparts just never have to deal with. Uh, on April 18th, she gave birth to a baby with Down syndrome. Uh, the role of vice president, it seems to me, would take up an awful lot of her time, and it raises the issue of how much time will she have to dedicate to her newborn child? So, I've got 10 bucks for anyone who can find me a clip of any reporter anywhere ever asking if getting elected in 2008 would have made Barack Obama a bad dad to Sasha or Malia. And yet we see this all the time when moms run for office. But media, in general, are basically hostile to the very idea of women in power. We have the Wicked Witch of the West, you know, uh, the Nancy Pelosi. When Hillary Clinton speaks, men here take out the garbage. She's a stereotypical bitch. After four years, don't you think every man in America will go insane? Just the look, the look toward him, looking like Everyone's first wife standing outside the door. <laughs> There's just something about her that feels castrating, overbearing, and scary. It's a Hillary Clinton nutcracker. They're going like hotcakes in Rochester, Minnesota, where they have talked. What do you think they're saying about Hillary? I don't know, but that is so perfect. As I have often said, <laughs> when she comes on television, I involuntarily cross my legs. And then on, MS, on MSNBC, the Chris Matthews show, they actually photoshopped devil horns over Hillary Clinton's head and called her a she-devil. But they put a question mark there, so, you know, it's okay. We did this to all our regular panelists. Is it smart politics for Republicans to demonize Hillary Clinton? Get real personal about it. Eleven say yes. Sarah Palin, oh, speaking of don't want. So, women of color in the political realm face an added level of media stereotyping and racial bigotry. Listen to how these media personalities describe the first Latina member of the Supreme Court and America's first black first lady. I think I'm going to send Sotomayor and her club a bunch of vacuum cleaners to help them clean up after their meetings. Yes. The image of an angry Michelle Obama has long been fodder for critics. I have a lot of people who call me on the radio and say she looks angry. Mm -hmm. And I'd say there's some validity to that. She looks like an angry woman. You don't think she's a black militant? Look at the image of African American women who are on television. Politically, you have uh, Maxine uh, or Waters of, uh, of California, a liberal Democrat. She's always angry every time she gets on television. Cynthia McKinney, the former congresswoman from Georgia, was another angry black woman. Mrs. Grievance, 
this was a screen cap where they were talking about Michelle as Obama's baby mama. Oh, sorry. I'll be ah, that was, that came over too quickly. Um, <coughs> Sorry, 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 sorry. I don't know how that immediately, how that jumps, so whatever. Sorry. Yeah. So she was supposed to have a political image makeover, Michelle, and the, that image makeover is going to entail basically silhouette pole dancer type makeover. Cause, Probably know. Wolf would get out chili dogs with the da, dietary dominatrix, uh, Michelle Obama. So, basically, what's the impact of all this? Well, I'll just let Hillary Clinton and Sarah Palin tell you. But tonight, we are crossing party lines to address the now very ugly role that sexism is playing in the campaign. An issue which I am frankly surprised to hear people suddenly care about. But Sarah, one thing we can agree on is that sexism can never be allowed to permeate an American election. So please, stop photoshopping my head on sexy bikini pictures. And stop saying I have cankles. Don't refer to me as a milf. Reporters and commentators, stop using words that diminish us like pretty, attractive, beautiful, harpy, shrew, <laughs> boner shrinker. So, you put the lights back on. Um, I figured we could use a little comic relief after all of that, but unfortunately, there's really nothing funny about the consequences of this kind of media coverage for female leadership or the perception of girls that they could possibly aspire to leadership. By focusing so constantly on irrelevant, personal, gender-specific details about women in Congress, presidential candidates, Supreme Court justices, instead of reporting on these women's public policy positions and their qualifications for office, media imply that these are ladies first, leaders only a distant second, if at all. In this way, corporate journalism sends the public the idea that women are less serious, less qualified, and less electable than their male counterparts. And in doing so, then media discourage women from entering the political pipeline, making it more difficult for women to win when they run and lessen their efficacy as leaders after they're elected. What this, mean, um, this means, basically, that media is shortchanging America because half of our country's leadership potential is being squandered, or at the very least being demonized. Um, so we can do lights again. Now, media images matter, and media coverage like this is one of the reasons why um, we are, America ranks 90th in the world in percentages of women in national legislatures, why women are only 17% of Congress, why we are, uh, why 67 countries have had female presidents or prime ministers, but the closest America has ever come is Gina Davis on a Hollywood backlot playing the president in a short-lived TV series, Commander in Chief. But on that show, when that show was on the air, 68% of viewers were, said they were more likely to accept a female president than people who didn't watch. Um, so after watching Commander in Chief, you know, they got the idea that women could actually make a, an impact in the government. And I'm hoping that CBS's new show, Madam Secretary, has a similar impact um, on public perceptions. Yet Hollywood rarely gives the public a chance to accept the idea of women as leaders. For example, in 129 family films released between 2006 and 2011, there wasn't even one female character with a speaking role playing a political figure, though men had 45 speaking roles as politicians, ranging from mayor to president. That's a national impact. But let's look at the impact on all of us in this room today. When we see news treating the most powerful women in America with such gender-based bullying and disrespect, <coughs> The media is unintentionally teaching us that no matter what media, women and girls accomplish, really the only thing that will ever truly matter about them is how they look, what they wear, and who they sleep with. We start to internalize the message that leadership and women just don't mix. And studies show that when they're very young, roughly the same number, we can turn the lights back on, um, roughly the same number of boys, uh, I'm sorry, when they're young, roughly the same number of boys and girls say they want to be president. 
But as they get older, boys continue to say they want to be president and they have what it takes to do that, while girls' interest in leadership uh, peaks at age eight, the age of my friend Ella's daughter. The older they get, the less likely those girls I showed you pictures of earlier, the less likely they are to think political leadership is something that they could possibly pursue. And according to a scholastic poll of first to eighth graders, 81% of girls just like those girls I showed you earlier said they don't want to be president compared to 66% of boys who said they do. Is it any wonder why after all the clips we just saw? And as I asked in the award-winning documentary Misrepresentation, which you can get on Netflix per tip, um, if journalists are so willing to trivialize and degrade the most powerful women in the country, well, what does it say about the media's ability to take any woman in America seriously? Well, this has implications for the way modern journalism reports on and the way American public, uh, the American public understand women in business, in economics, in philanthropy, in academia, in foreign policy, in basically every industry. So let's take a look at how media portray women achieving power outside of the political realm. Lights, please. Uh, nothing sums up the media's portrayal of professional women more succinctly than this obnoxious Weston ad campaign aimed surprisingly at female business travelers. So if you can read that, it says, uh, she planned the annual meeting. She plans on it being a matching success. She plans on getting a huge promotion. Pause. Who is she sleeping with? So get it? Get it? Because Weston has beds, and women really, they can only get ahead if they're good in bed. And so she can sleep her way to the top, and then she can offer, uh, enjoy a good night's sleep on the road. Right? It's not a new narrative. It's insulting, but it's been ever present in media for decades. Um, news media have been demonizing women in the workplace for ages, but so have, uh, so have various movies and other forms of pop culture. Take a look at this trailer for the 1993 temp, the, uh, thriller, sorry, the 1993 thriller, The Temp, uh, where Lauren Flynn Boyle played a secretary who seduces her boss to get a promotion and then ends up not only destroying his life, but destroying the entire company. May I help you? I work here. This is my office. Oh, Mr. Durns. I I'm Chris Bowling. Oh, yeah. The temp. Hello. Hey, didn't you tell me you want to fool around there, secretary? I am the temp. Who knows that? Quite a temp. You want to call your husband and tell him you're working late? No. Chris, I hope you can offer my assistance. Maybe someday it won't be your assistant. Someone is leaking marketing strategy to our competitors. Chris, you can get off now. Run away. She's got a hidden agenda, Raj. She wants to be my boss. Oh, so no! I'm not sure about anything. <laughs> Did you believe that they made me marketing manager? Now I got a tip telling me what to do. Do you find that you respond to someone who cares desperately about something? Anything? I'm not selling secret charm. Well, what are you doing, Peter? What's going on? You have been acting like an insane someone in this company is trying to destroy me. For Peter Derns. <laughs> It's time to wake up. Stop doing this to me! And smell the coffee. The temp. So, um, you flights, please. Uh, this isn't really a new narrative. Uh, and the uh, this sort of media antagonism toward women in the workplace is still permeating even journalism. So if you don't believe me, just type the search term bad female boss into Google and you'll get 87,900,000 results. And you might even get more because I did that search term like a few months ago. Um, and those include headlines like Bloomberg News' The Female Boss Problem and uh, financial websites with dire headlines like A Female Boss Could Be Your Worst Nightmare. Uh, I'm gonna fast forward 
cast a few things. Uh, let's see, two, Okay, so now let's move away from adult-oriented media toward youth-oriented media that's made especially for girls. Let's say eight-year-old Ella, or any of the other girls, take the remote away from their moms, and they turn off the news shows, and they flip the remote to shows that they love, shows that they identify with. For example, America's Next Top Model. Since its 2003 debut, Top Model has been, had a fiercely loyal audience of tween and teen girls, at times kept bringing in more than five million teen and tween girls each week. So what do girls learn from that show? Well, the series is based on one explicit message, and that is that girls and young women's only source of power is their bodies, their appearances, and that they can only really be considered beautiful if they conform to an unhealthily skinny ideal. And on Top Model, none of Ella or Julia or Nina or Phoebe or Zoe's many talents and skills would be considered impressive unless they accomplished all those things wearing size two bikinis and a metric ton of makeup. The show has also sent impressive messages that are just as dangerous as, uh, but, are, but are rarely discussed. Though the following images that I'm going to show you, so lights please, uh, are they aired on <coughs> network TV at 8 p.m. on a show aimed at teens and tween kids. They're actually graphic and disturbing, so if you need a trigger warning, this is it. So, these photos come from an episode of Top Model that made contestants pose as sexy homicide victims decked out in skimpy lingerie and tattered cocktail dresses, while the girls practiced their best mutilated, mangled, and murdered poses. The judges raved about how stunning they looked as corpses, saying things like gorgeous, amazing, beautiful, Sometimes they reprimanded with stage direction, like, move your arm, we need you to look like you're brutally murdered, not like you're just sleeping. And the praise that stood out most starkly to me was, death becomes you, young lady. And in another photo shoot, the girls were actually made to lie in coffins in open graves while they were lowered into these open graves in a cemetery. So, media messages equating gruesome violence against women with beauty and glamour dehumanize women, making such acts in real life appear not only more palatable and less shocking, but even aspirational. For example, listen to Top Model's executive producer and judge, Tyra Banks, explaining why girls who model should imagine themselves in physical pain. It's the biggest modeling secret trick tip that you can get. When you're stuck and you don't know what to do, Mr. J is yelling at you, go, it hurts. Okay? Think pain, but beauty. The headache. Ow. 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 Spray my ankle. Ow. Spray my ankle. to the movie. And you have to do a scene where the man strangled you and your neck hurts after that scene. Whenever you're stuck on set and you don't know what to do, think about the pain. So the more media routinize and glamorize the idea that, quote, pain is pretty for women, the more likely it is for girls to internalize the message that pain and abuse are just normal parts of a woman's life. And here's what it's not just violence uh, that is deeply re regressive in reality TV. Many other regressive messages are sent. Here's what Mike Fleiss, the creator and executive producer of TV's longest running dating franchise, The Bachelor and The Bachelorette, says is the single most criter important criteria women have to have if they want to be cast on their shows. Going to the bachelorette, we take all kinds of things into consideration. Their psychological exams, their blood tests, and most importantly, they have to look good in the hot tub. Their sole ambition, their only goal in 
wife is to become passive 1950s style uh, wives subservience to their husbands. I will make the best wife for Bob because I will be a servant to him. And if he comes home for a long day um, at the office, I'll just rub his feet and have dinner ready for him and just blow on him. And reality TV is also riddled with racist stereotypes about black and Latino women as hypersexual, ignorant, vulgar, and violent, and as maids and servants to the men in their lives. So what's the best time I'm going to like that? Um, I actually enjoy fighting. I got to take the girl, I got to put the shop on down the stairs, and I can make any man, and I got to be cursing in the street on a Sunday, and I just came from church. Get back, bitch. Get your back. Don't touch me. Bitch. I want to know that a girl can keep my house clean. I'm going to clean my man's spot up for me. Fortune 1000 media and telecom companies. 
And when it comes to a true agenda-setting power, women have only a paltry 3% of clout titles. Those are positions like CEO, CFO, etc. in these media companies. Finally, who's getting rich off of all this media content? Well, it's certainly not women or people of color who own respectively 5% and 3% of commercial broadcast TV stations. So, one of the core principles of media literacy is following the money, asking questions about who owns and creates and distributes and profits from any given piece of media. The purpose of media today is not actually to engage or entertain or inform us. The purpose is simply to make profit because of media consolidation. The purpose is to make profits for the six mega merch media companies that own the vast majority of what we're given to watch, see, and hear in newspapers, TV, radio, billboards, movies, video games, and so on. So the key to media profits is advertising, a multi-billion dollar industry whose uh, ideology has historically been outrageously biased. Advertising images infantilize grown women and sexualize young girls, trigger a range of eating disorders, portray women as inferior, subservient objects to be used or controlled by men, and advertising often romanticizes a range of violence against women. So for example, in this perfume ad uh, that says, uh, apply generously to your neck so he can smell the scent as you shake your head no. This was in a teen magazine. Advertising images normalize a range of abusive scenarios, including everything from gang rape to the idea that women even, quote, relish sexual assault by law enforcement officers, as you'll see in a second. Um, and men are told that sexually exploitative or predatory behavior is what being a real man is all about, as in this Mitchum aftershave ad, quote, if you convinced her the photos are for your private collection, you're a Mitchum man. Which, you know, translation, congrats, bro, you convinced your girlfriend you're not going to sell new pics of her to porn sites. A plus. I mean, come on. Um, and, you know, it gets worse from there, as in this bitch skateboard ad with the universal male symbol <laughs> pointing a gun at the universal woman's head. Um, whether the consumers of these images are girls or women, boys or men, the messages are very similar. The messages are that women are beautifully executed. Um, so advertising specifically dehumanizes women of color, but we'll show you that after the, the execution of beautiful corpses images. That's Quincy Jones, by the way. Um, the dehumanization of women of color in advertising often takes the form of uh, depicting them in, in ads for decades as lions and zebras and monkeys and other quote-unquote exotic animals, literally not human, often in jungles or cages, in chains. So, okay, I'm going to fast, we're running a little late, so I'm going to fast forward to... <coughs> Tomorrow, you can see the clips that uh, we're fast forwarding through. There is gonna, I was going to show you some product placement, but we're going to have a whole long section about product placement tomorrow. So, um, as bad as all that was, there are bright spots. For example, it's now possible to find ads that are based on the notion that if you just give girls and women access to the right information and tools, there's no limit to how well they'll succeed or what they can accomplish. So, lights. That's an ad. I would buy those shoes. Thanks, Susie. Why don't you use this? It's got a calculator. Thanks, Dad. This is the neighborhood. You get Elm Street, you can get Main Street. Thank you. And that's your first quote. So you want a slide in your office? Your small businesses choose Verizon Wireless and any other wireless carrier. Where's Susie? Is she expecting me? Because they know the small business with the best technology rules. So, the Verizon ad shows it's absolutely possible and so much more effective, right, for who we are as Americans in 2014, to make media that defies stereotypes rather than reinforces them. So, I have more good news for you, which is that there are lots of options if you want to start challenging bias in the media, whether it's gender bias, race bias, or other forms. 
The first is that I really would love to encourage you to support nuanced and independent media. And not just independent, actually. We live in an era in which smart, funny, flawed, nuanced depictions of diverse women and girls are just one Netflix download or one mass click away. Some of these shows are airing today on television, and some you know, were taken off the air years and years ago. But they're all available. Um, and so here are just a few that were fun and interesting from over the years. There was Murphy Brown, a late 80s sitcom about a powerful woman journalist. There was Roseanne, an 80s, 90s sitcom about a working class family with a feminist mom. There was Buffy the Vampire Slayer, a 90s, 2000s show about a girl who saved the world a lot. Um, there was Veronica Mars, a 2000 drama about a teen girl who was a private eye and solved rape, rape investigations. There's the medical drama, the red medical soap, uh, Grey's Anatomy, with a diverse cast of women doctors. Not always great plot lines or depictions, but at least the casting is great. Um, there's the procedural crime drama Bones, centered around a brilliant female scientist and a lot of other really smart female supporting characters. On Scandal, Carrie Washington, oh, there's Parks and Rec, I forgot to say, um, where this is basically my favorite sitcom ever about a relentlessly optimistic public servant and politician. Um, and Scandal stars Carrie Washington, who literally is the first black woman to head a network drama on a, a primetime drama in more than 20 years. Um, Girls is written and produced by Lena Dunham, who is one of the only major showrunners under 30 working today. And independent options exist, like The Misadventures of Awkward Black Girl, which is a totally Kickstarter-funded project, a comedy produced by and starring Issa Rae. Um, it came, became so popular online that she ended up getting a deal on ABC for Sean, with Shauna Sean, Rhimes, I believe, and that will come in 2015. So when you're looking for entertainment, I hope that you'd watch and also blog about, tweet about, talk about shows whose casts are diverse, whose writing is nuanced, whose storylines don't revolve around the kinds of outdated ideas that I showed you earlier. Um, next, I really think it's incredibly important to support and demand diversity in journalism. So you can seek out and support independent, non-commercial journalistic options, news outlets that aren't beholden to the corporate owners I showed you before and are then much less influenced by advertiser pressures. For example, magazines like The Nation, World Pulse, Bitch, Feminist Response to Pop Culture, online independent news sites and blogs like Women's E News, Color Lines, Alternate, Feministing, Proud Feminist Collective, Racialicious, um, independent TV news and radio programs like Grit TV or Uprising and Sonali Collect Car or Democracy Now. And if you're interested, you can also create your own independent media. And with your own blogs, podcasts, video blogs, probably student-run TV, uh, TV shows, at, if you have any of that on your campus. And luckily, after decades of media activism, we're starting to see just how much a difference it can make when smart, savvy women are given access to decision-making, story-shifting power positions in corporate media. Melissa Harris Perry's show at MSNBC, which I'll show you now, um, is showing every episode the difference that it makes when an African-American woman who is a scholar, she's the first person that I can ever remember, and I've, I've been doing journalism, and I'm a media critic for two decades, and I can't remember any other uh, news commentary show that was headed by a professor, not a journalist. Um, she is, uh, she's bringing, her show actually, I'll, what I'll say, is her show proves that having women and people of color at the top matters and can broaden the process and scope of journalism in positive ways. Harris Perry covers topics that are rarely discussed on TV news and shares the mic with people whose perspectives are seldom heard. And yeah, that's me on the top on the next market show. Um, but that's not why I show you most Harris Perry's show. Um, my third solution is that if we want to enrich uh, rather than stifle girls' and women's development, we can get involved with media literacy and media activism. So my organization, Women in Media and News, uh, this, is, this is our org, um, uses communication technology tools uh, and advocacy points, uh, advocacy campaigns, to change the landscape. Um, but those comm tools have never been cheaper to access or use 
for you as well. You don't have to wait or rely on media corporations to tell your stories. You can learn how to make your own media and tell your own authentic stories. Lots of nonprofits out there can help you do that. My group, Women in Media News, we work to increase women's presence, power, and diversity in public debate through media monitoring and analysis through media literacy education and communications trainings, um, through media justice campaigns to create more fair, socially responsible policies regulating the industry. Um, there are also groups like Media Literacy Project, um, which have a variety of programs for getting uh, media literacy in K through 12 schools. Check out their bad ads contest on their website and their deconstruction gallery at mediateracyproject.org. Um, and then there are groups like Real Girls in Seattle that teach teen girls how to do video production, giving them the creative and tech tools they need to write, record, produce, and distribute their own films. So get a load of teen filmmaker Sammy Muhlenberg in 2008 with the skills that she learned from her media training at Real Girls. Sammy made the film Generation of Consolidation about the impact of media consolidation on news content and how this affects youth as viewers and media makers. This, uh, the very first clip of her film, you'll see her testifying before the FCC. The next speaker at the mic is Sammy Kuva. Are you Sammy? And she's number 47. Sammy, you have two minutes. Hi, my name is Sammy Kuva, and I'm a senior at Ballard High School. Commissioners, <laughs> Commissioners, I am not going to tell you that you should further consolidate media ownership. I'm going to tell you that you cannot further consolidate media ownership. <laughs> and about net neutrality. Oh, I should tell you though that Sammy actually won a student Emmy for that film that she made in high school. So remember that the next time you think, oh, I'm too young or I don't have the right credentials yet, you can do anything. Um, so I'm gonna actually not tell you much of what I was going to tell you about net neutrality. I'll just say that um, of all the media policy issues and all the ways that you can change media for the better, which we can talk about in the Q&A later in the reception, um, there are so many different ways that you can get involved. We won't go into that right now, but the, there is one, I have one last clip to, to show you, so just, it'll be another just one minute, just stay with me for a sec. Because um, we started like four minutes late. Um, so uh, there's this, there's one media policy issue right now that is absolutely crucial to the way media are operating, the way we can access information, the way that we can create independent media, and that is net neutrality. Public comment period recently closed, but you can still call your Congress members and ask them to tell the FCC that it's crucial that they protect net neutrality. And rather than explaining it all myself, I will let Stephen Colbert close it out. Mason, I love the internet, and the internet loves me back. Why else would it offer me so much sex? <laughs> That's why I was shocked last week when I heard this gossip about the internet from its frenemy, television. The way we use the internet could change after federal appeals court struck down net neutrality rules. The fallout over a big decision that may change how the web works and the future of so-called net neutrality. We could be witnessing the end of the internet as we know it. Nation, I hope you know what this means because I do not. <laughs> maybe, may, may, maybe the TV knows. Net neutrality is the idea that broadband internet service providers, Comcast, Time Warner Cable, Verizon, and others should treat everything that flows across the internet equally. Thanks, TV. You see, <laughs> under net neutrality, every site on the internet has to be equally accessible to the user, whether it be a huge behemoth like Google or some obscure little mom and pop site like Bing. <laughs> but folks, this court ruling this recent court ruling ends all of that. Net neutrality advocates say this ruling could also allow internet service providers to slow everything and then 
charge you extra to allow faster access to a particular site like Amazon. You might have to pay more for specific websites. There are a million different ways that you might have to pay. Folks, I will not stand for my content being held hostage for cash. We must rise as one against the cable companies and... <laughs> Folks, I've rethought my position on net neutrality. What I meant to say was, like all Americans, I love my cable company. <laughs> okay, so lights up. Um, you can get involved in net neutrality rules and campaigns.